Welcome, welcome to this extraordinary gathering. Thank you all for demonstrating by your attendance today that you too are cutting edge leaders in your community. Whether you're listening today or speaking today, you are on that leading edge that shows up prepared to hyper-focus on the vital importance of women and girls leadership, a critical pillar of this, your women's fund. We today have over 280 participants uh, who, who decided to, to sign up to be with us today. Uh, we welcome each and all. Uh, we want to let you know that we have so many people who are amazing that we can't even mention. What a guest list. We thank the Miami Herald for joining us as well as new digital outlets. We thank both NBC6 and the New Times for their coverage yesterday. Media matters, coverage matters, focus on women and girls matters, thank you. We have candidates for the school board. Thank you for your willingness to serve. We have Judge Carol Kelly, representative of the office of Ms. Uh, Congresswoman Shalala, and many, many more. Past board members, new board members, sponsors who have proven themselves to be passionate about our mission, like the sponsor of this Impact Collaborative Series, the Miami Dolphins Football Unites. Also, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau, Citrus Health, who are helping to sponsor our powerful July domestic violence awareness campaign in these critical times of COVID-19, and Kaufman Rawson, who are the sponsors of August's Equal Pay Campaign, which you'll laugh when you see one of our upcoming slides. 100 years later, we still need to keep demanding equal pay. So Kaufman Rawson's billboard will say, Daddy, why do you pay women less? And it's a question we need to keep on asking until it is answered. We have longtime donors here with grassroots donors, contributors who act on their belief that when women are strong, the world is strong. Contributions matter. And to that point, we're gonna take a very special moment to recognize our partnership and the contributions of the Miami Super Bowl host committee to the incredible campaign that together we worked. Ray Martinez, executive director, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing us this opportunity to present here right before your, your, your symposium, your forum here. And on uh, behalf of Rodney Barreto, our chairman of the uh, Miami Super Bowl host committee, uh, we're, we're just so fortunate and grateful to have had this partnership together. And just to go back and give you a little uh, history of how this happened, it's when I actually came on board, which was on 2018, uh, one of the things in working with the NFL that we were asked to, you know, to take on, you know, that was not in our obligation as a host committee, but one of the things the NFL asked us to do was to uh, create a, a, an effort uh, on anti-sex trafficking because it was such an important topic it was one of the social initiatives that the uh, NFL had. And so we took that on. And one of the first things that I did is I reached out to Kathy Fernandez Rundle's office, as well as the U.S. Attorney's office. And I brought a group in and, um, you know, kind of talked about, you know, how, how do we tackle this? How do we deal with this? Um, my hope actually was that the state attorney and the U.S. attorney would co-chair this committee for us. But they both turned to me and said, we can't really do that, but we have somebody in, in an organization that can, and that's how the Women's Fund came into uh, the process. And so the Women's Fund uh, became the chair and uh, really spearheaded this uh, effort, you know, through the entire planning and then in the execution of the weeks and months leading up to the Super Bowl. And now even on, you know, because so, that was one of the things that we had collectively talked about uh, wanting to be able to do is not only do this just for the week of the Super Bowl or the two weeks of the Super Bowl, but have a lasting impact after. And we had a unique and have a unique opportunity because next year's Super Bowl is in Tampa. And so, you know, two, two games, two years in the state of Florida, we really thought that it would be a, a, an incredible opportunity to have a sustained effort you know, going on here, uh, you know, associated with the major events such as the Super Bowl. And so that's what, that's what we did and that's what the committee focused on. And uh, as I said, we were just so fortunate and blessed really and honored to be a part of what the Women's Fund was able to do. And I'm sure most of you saw 
the campaign and, and the media presence and the uh, messaging that went out um, behind all that was, you know, a very strong group. Uh, uh, many of uh, are joined in here. Um, we also did education opportunities with, uh, you know, our hospitality industry, the hotels and, and uh, you know, convention uh, visitors bureau people with, within the transportation industry, the taxi cab industry, the Uber and Lyft, the rideshare industry. Of trying to really bring awareness, you know, because that's the most important thing is, you know, what what should they be looking for? And when they see it, what did they do with it? And so that that's part of what the entire campaign was about. As part of that, we, we uh, hosted and, and uh, put together a golf tournament uh, and uh, to really uh, raise funny, raise monies and, uh, you know, obviously bring people together. And as a result of that golf tournament, we were able to raise uh, Fifty thousand dollars, which today we are committing and giving to the women's fund, you know, as part of that, and so uh, that's what this is all about. Is really a virtual check presentation, if you will. I don't have a check, but a virtual and check thank presentation. Thank you so much, Ray, for that because we did invest that and much more of this entire community on that amazing outreach campaign because. Uh, sex trafficking and human trafficking are 365, 24 seven. They don't come with the Super Bowl, but we harnessed all that energy working with you, the state attorney and many, many more, the US Attorney's Office. Thank you so much for your support. This is ongoing, this does not stop. We'll have another Impact Collaborative in September on the same issue. And you're right, there are so many people on this call today who are part of one team and this one team is not stopping. And Tampa is calling us every day. So we're already helping Tampa as well. So thanks so much for being with us today, Ray. And thanks to Rodney as well and the entire Super Bowl host committee. Okay. Well, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, and I look forward to getting back with you and continuing our efforts. Wonderful. Wonderful. And now I'm going to introduce our other extraordinary partners today. We are marking in 2020, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women, many women in the US, the right to vote. Look at that photo before we move forward. Equal pay for equal work, 100 years later. Here we go. Introducing our partners for today in this Impact Collaborative, I'd like to introduce Marisol Centeno, the past president of the League of Women Voters of Miami-Dade County, who is now candidate for Miami-Dade County property appraiser and the current league president and executive director of the Miami-Dade County Commission for Women, Monica Skoko Rodriguez. Thrilled you both are here. Monica, take it away. Hello everybody and thank you so much for including... I'm sorry. I was going to start with Marisol. Marisol <laughs> first. My fault. No problem. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, and thank you to all the women leaders here in the community today, especially the ones that uh, have uh, volunteered their time and are running for office and continue to do great work as elected officials. I've had the pleasure to work with many of you. As we celebrate the passing of the 19th Amendment and the women's victory in the, right, in the fight for the right to vote, we must remember, as you say, that due to racism and Jim Crow laws, our African-American, Hispanic, and Native sisters were not able to vote. The struggle continues today. From the beginning of time, women have been leaders in their family, their communities, and the world. And now, more than ever, as women, we need to reclaim our power in society and be a beacon of light to help others. I am grateful for the opportunities that I've had to lead. I am and be led. I've learned a lot and continue to learning. And I'm looking forward to learning more about each of you and your paths to leadership. As you know, and uh, I completed my term at the, League of, at the helm of the League of Women Voters. And it is my pleasure that another great leader, our president, Monica Scoco Rodriguez, will continue the league's mission in the protection of voting rights and empowerment of voters. While moving forward to the next 100 years at the League of Women Voters as an inclusive and diverse society and organization. Thank you so much for being here 
and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Monica. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for including the League of Women Voters in this incredibly important and nonpartisan discussion about women in leadership. Rising young leaders and women who may have never thought of themselves as leaders alike need to hear these conversations so that we may all grow and so more and more of us can begin to think that we are worthy and capable of leading. Conversations like this build the toolbox that we all need with the guidance of those before us. This is an incredibly important year for us at the Commission for Women and the League of Women Voters as the League celebrates our centennial along with the suffrage movement. The Commission for Women has a goal of improving the status of all women in Miami and we're so proud to be here today learning from each of these leaders. The League of Women Voters similarly has a mission of empowering voters and defending democracy. And during this year, we're doing all that we can to ensure everyone eligible to vote feels empowered and safe doing so, primarily by helping people to understand the safety and ease of vote by mail. During this centennial year, the League is looking to our past to create a better future for our community. And that includes reckoning with the League's racist roots. Our founder, Carrie Chapman Catt, once said, white supremacy will be strengthened by women's suffrage. Com confronting this past head on with innovative and community-based solutions is the only way forward for organizations like the League in order to reinvent ourselves as a force for justice and equity and truly live by our mission of defending democracy and empowering voters. Let us look at the centennial not only as a celebration, but as a long due awakening and call to action. Thank you all and thank you to all of our leaders for speaking today. Thank you. Now, I'm gonna tell you how this is gonna work. We have so much talent here and we don't have a lot of time, so we're gonna be brilliantly focused. We have a question from one of our young leaders and she is going to, add, that's how we're gonna have you each introduce yourselves within context in one minute. We have our wonderful staff from the Women's Fund working with us. Carolina Garcia, our Programs and Operations Director, is going to be monitoring the chat for your suggestions from the listeners about how to deal with some of the issues that we are facing in our community and encourage more leadership from women and girls. She will monitor and keep all of your suggestions. Please do post them there. And our charming yet very well organized uh, Viviana Alvarado Pacheco is going to be putting a little chime. So if you go over your one or two minutes, um, we'll, we'll have her giving us the nod. And I may interrupt you or have to mute you because we've got so many people who need to speak today and all voices need to be heard. We're thrilled with this turnout. So we're gonna try and be very well organized. Um, once again, this is not a debate nor a full candidate forum. This is about leadership and our access to it, especially the access of young voters and voters to be. The questions will be done by three brilliant, extraordinary young women who have choked me up as they have uh, been sending their questions and we've had the opportunity to talk these days. And it makes me really excited that they're gonna be taking over soon. Uh, so we're gonna start with a self introduction once again of each of our leaders, guests uh, in context of this question about leadership. And we're gonna go in the order you'll see in the slide. So we're not, um, we're not uh, confused. So the introductions are what motivated you to take action and to run for office? And we will begin with you, Ms. Barley. Am I, is Ms. Barley not? My, Ms. Barley hasn't connected not yet. Not with us. Yes. Ms. DeMond. Good morning, ladies, and good morning, Facebook, and everyone else that is watching. Um, the question is, what motivated me to basically run for office, to run for, um, to be the mayor of Miami-Dade County? I think it was just, you know, sometimes when you think, you go, what is it? I've always been a fighter, in a sense. Um, and when I say fighter, meaning always looking for justice. 
And I knew that at a young age that I was not seeing justice because I can see where injustice was all around me. And I never knew that today that I, was at, that I would actually be running for mayor. But as I reflect back, I realize why. You know, when it's in your blood to say, I want fairness, I don't see it around and have, having to have lived a life where um, I can begin to say that I am a Latina, Haitian, American, Black, immigrant woman, and I identified that because there are white Haitians, there are Lebanese Haitians, so that's why you will hear me say Black immigrant woman. I realized that I am at a disadvantage because of how society has systematically set everything. So my reason for running is to let people know and to let young ladies know and to let young men know as well, doesn't matter what you see or anyone that is attempting to hinder you, once you have a vision, which is what I have, you go for it and you don't look back. And as a leader, it's good to bring people along with you because that's what identifies a leader. So my okay. reason for running is I wanna make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Fulton, welcome. Uh, you're on mute, Ms. Fulton, excuse me. Thank you, okay. hi. Okay. I wanna say thank you for having me and um, to all the listeners, thank you for tuning in. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to run for office is because it was something that I, of course, I prayed on, but I did not um, make the decision until I thought my mind was ready in order to do so. I wanted to definitely see change in Miami-Dade County. I came from Miami-Dade County. Um, I worked there for over 20 years with Miami-Dade County. I'm familiar with the departments. I'm also a resident of Miami-Dade County, so I'm familiar with the services they provide. And um, I just feel like, you know, as a person who lives in the community, who went to school in the community, who graduated from the community, um, I'm a part of the community. I'm a product of the community. And I think that with every, with, with all of that being said, that it's important that we have somebody in that seat that speaks for the community, that's still connected to the community and understands and listens to what the community wants. And so I just want to give the seat back to the residents. Um, I truly believe that we have to put people over profit and we just have to have somebody in there with leadership skills that is open, that's honest, and that's willing to just do the right thing. And that's me. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Commissioner Higgins. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, when I think back to why I ran, uh, I had lived in Miami and then I had gotten transferred away for several years and then I moved back because I love it. But in moving back, it was the only place I'd ever lived as an adult where the quality of life had gone downhill rather than um, improved. So cost of housing was worse and higher. Traffic was worse. Transit was less reliable. Um, we still had made no progress on creating jobs that uh, were more diverse and higher paying. And I, for those of you that, that know me, I have had a uh, 20 plus year private sector career um, working in very large businesses. But then I also had pivoted um, in my last 10 years to be a public service and worked as the director of the Peace Corps. And I thought perhaps those skills brought together could do some of the things that are needed to work on that equity gap, right? The, the rich folks here are really rich and other folks are left behind. And we need our economy, like this part of the economy has to work in order for others to have access. So I thought I would give it a try since I had been away and no progress was made and I thought, you know what, I have the skills that I think might be able to solve some of those problems. And I rose my hand two years ago and 
said, well, we'll see. Maybe the folks will elect me to try to make Miami-Dade County a, a better place. And I was fortunate enough to get elected. And I'm very, very grateful that they chose me to try to be of service. And I continue to focus on um, transit, housing, and small business development. And I will continue to do so. So thanks, ladies and the gentlemen that support us uh, for gathering everyone together here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ms. Lee Kinsler, I, if you can unmute and if, you could, if you'd like to roll your camera. Yay, good morning, all yours. Good morning, everyone. This is not a choice, this is mandated. I am the community that everyone say we represent, we help, we do. I'm from this community, I live in this community, I teach in this community, I have businesses in this community and I've never seen the majority and I've never seen and had access to the things that they say we have for a community that I don't see that's re receiving it. So I decided to run instead of complain about what's going on because everything that we say for the community doesn't seem to reach the community that I'm from. And I just don't understand it. And as a person that's from here, live here, work here, play here, serve here, marry here, raise children here, teach children here, where are these accesses of things that we need to make this community thrive? Because as a married woman, my husband give me some money to pay something, to take care of something. I don't have to document it. I don't have to say the work will speak for itself and I don't see it in our community. Thank you so much, Ms. Lee Kinsler. Um, uh, is, uh, uh, Ms. Lerner with us. I know she was trying to log on. Ms. She'll Lerner? be answering but by phone. By phone. Can you hear me? Good morning. We can. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. I know you came early uh, but trying to log on. Oh, yes. you're we have one minute for you here with an introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the question was what motivated you to take action and run? Um, the first time I ran for office was uh, for Florida legislature in the year 2000. Uh, what motivated me was my career as an attorney uh, working at the Guardian Ad Litem program in Dade County Juvenile Court. Um, I was there for 16 years. Over the course of my representation of Guardian Ad Litems trying to represent the best interests of abused and neglected children, I realized how uh, dysfunctional the entire child welfare system was, the uh, access to services was non-existent, and I realized that many of the things that were causing problems emanated from the legislature. So to be the best advocate I could, I started talking to legislators and explaining what the problems were, where the investments should be made, and uh, again, realized what the problem was. These legislators knew very little and cared even less about what was happening in the child welfare system. And I had an immediate realization that to be the best advocate I could be, that I needed to be the one determining the laws, the policies, the budget allocation, and uh, that's, that's what motivated me. I worked that's really wonderful. hard and, and ran and was elected. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Commissioner Levine Kava. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. I agree these impact collaboratives are about the best community conversations ever and so proud to be part of uh, this one today. Uh, so I have been an activist since childhood, always trying to right wrongs, always wanting to be at the table of decision making. But I did my work for decades outside of government. In fact, I was the one petitioning government, organizing coalitions to come down and speak to the county commission about critical issues like the need to adequately fund social services, uh, to make sure that there were counselors in the school system that our Head Start program 
uh, was, was adequately supported. So righting wrongs was my business outside of government, but finally trying to restore trust in government, which had gotten so low, it was time for me to step up and go inside to try to transform from inside. So in 2014, I left Catalyst Miami, which I'd founded after uh, many years of service, uh, 35 in Miami-Dade, now 40. I uh, actually served with um, uh, Miss Lerner and the Guardian Ed Lightham program uh, and many other roles. So in office for six years, I'm really proud of the record that we've uh, that I've tackled, but we live in paradise, but paradise is in peril and there is so much more that needs to be done. And so it is so important that a woman of uh, leadership and experience step up and shatter that big glass ceiling right here in Miami-Dade County and, and bring, um, bring common sense solutions to our rising seas, to our affordability gap, to our opportunity gap, to our transportation gap, and all of these things that are so critical to resolve so that we can continue to thrive as a community. Thank so for that reason, I'm stepping up to be the next mayor of Miami-Dade County. Thank, thank you so much, Commissioner. Dr. McGee. Good morning, everyone. And, and thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, with the girls. I think that that's so important that we have uh, time to share our leadership um, opinions and skills and, and things with them. So the reason I'm running for Miami-Dade County Commissioner for District 3 is because I believe I can help. Uh, as a lifelong social service advocate, um, someone who listens and engages the community, uh, I really uh, see the positive impact that has had. And I think my sort of unique skill set, my academic and professional background, being a social worker, of uh, being, uh, again, a community advocate, has made me, um, you know, the, just the, the the unique skill set has made me the, the, the prime candidate for this position. Uh, that along with the support of the sitting uh, county commissioner and chairwoman, Audrey Edmondson, who has um, really provided a lot of leadership um, to this community. And I believe that it's because of that, um, that we need to have women in these roles and, and continue the, the succession of, the, of uh, a great woman in that seat. So thank you for this opportunity. I think you're on mute. Still. Ms. Metellus, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this really wonderful opportunity. It's great vitamin for a morning. And so, you know, I am running for this county commission, District 3 seat, uh, because on the heels of my 30 years, 30 plus years of uh, community engagement, community service, through education, through community building efforts, and most recently and currently as a nonprofit leader, I have gained an extensive amount of experience from uh, advocacy to solutions oriented uh, uh, programs to making sure that community comes together, community is heard, uh, relationships across the multiple sectors, multiple communities in our community. I speak the, the languages, the most uh, common languages of this community. I have had um, a number of people urge me to do this along the years uh, for so, so many, for such a long time, that I finally decided that I would raise my hand. And I'm raising my hand because I believe our community deserves better. I believe that someone of my background, my sensibilities, my sensitivities, my experience, my relationships, uh, I am the woman for this seat. I'm the woman for this job. I'm the woman for this moment. Thank you. Thank you all for your willingness to lead and to serve. It's an incredible panorama we have. I am in awe of each and every one of you. And I'm especially in awe of our next guest, uh, we have three amazing young leaders who are going to be asking the questions today. Uh, the first one is coming to us through one of the most incredible organizations I've had uh, the pleasure of working with here, one of the first grantees of the Women's Fund Miami-Dade, Urgent Inc. And I think many of that team from Urgent Inc. is listening in. So thank you for all you do always. Alkiria Jones, welcome. And you can unmute yourself. There you go. 
Good morning. I'm Alkiria Jones. I attend Dr. Michael Crop Senior High School as an upcoming senior. I am also an intern at Urgent Inc. where I am where I am in the entrepreneurship cohort. My plans after graduating high school are to attend Florida State University or University of Miami, where I plan to study pre-medicine to become an anesthesiologist. Yay, <laughs> welcome, so exciting. And your question, please uh, leaders, no more than two minutes. I know it's tough, but it will show your great skills. If we can each keep to two minutes, I hate interrupting you, but I will. I apologize in advance. Go ahead with your question, Elkiria. My question is, what do you think is the most significant barrier to female leadership and what makes someone a good leader? And we will go to Ms. Damon, please. Okay, so the question is barrier and what makes a woman a significant leader. Um, first part, the barrier. I don't want to blame it on society only, but because of society, women have a tendency to, to be dismissed, to be undervalued. Um, we are taught, and I'm going to ask this question, is it okay that I am real with you guys today? Because I think that's the best that I can be, is be real. So I'm going to tell you I'm going to be real with you. Um, women we are taught society teaches teaches us to be very mild mannered um very soft spoken um mothers and so yet when you have a woman like myself who was pretty much the same type of child um who is very passionate very outspoken and a go-getter that alone can sometimes cause society to say, wait, she is too abrupt. She is, um, and I'm going to use a word, but she is that angry black woman. No, it's passion. And when you have a woman like myself that has passion, some people may consider that to be a barrier. So my culture alone and who I am as a Latina Haitian black immigrant that alone is a barrier for me in society and i have had to learn to jump many hurdles so that way i can be who i am today what makes me or what makes a woman a great leader one is to know that you're able to carry people along effortlessly you're not doing it or i have not done it to appease society but i have been able to carry the youth along right without even thinking that's what i was doing but when you're able to gather gather the youth and others around to say hey let's talk about situations and they're willing to listen that is one characteristics of a leader because you can't lead yourself right you cannot lead yourself and i think we need to understand that I am sitting on a panel right now with many great women. I should be able to embrace every single experience that you women and young ladies have, are bringing to this table, have brought to society, and I should be able to glean on everything that you guys have done in order to, for me to continue my process. So to be a great leader, is to make sure that you're carrying people along and have the willingness to mentor. And that's one of the characteristics that I would say would be a great leader or many that's characteristics. Great. Thank you so much, so much, Ms. Fulton. Oh, just uh, muted. Unmute, there we go. Oh, Ms. Okay. Fulton, go ahead. Okay, that was a very in uh, interesting question. Um, probably going to get some really good answers. But what I want to say is, um, quite frankly, I think a lot of a, a barrier is a lot of people don't understand the powers that we have as women. They don't understand and they think that somebody has to encourage you. But a lot of times we have to start encouraging ourselves and then we can help encourage and encourage one another. So first, I'm going to say that one of the barriers is just pull from the powers that you have within. You are a specially created 
person. You are a specially created individual. And we have to realize that. We also have to realize that as, as girls and women, we are the ones that keep the family together. We are the ones that keep the communities together. We are so very close. Well, we were so very close in 2016 of having a woman president. That means a lot. That gives me hope to know that I have to keep reaching for the sky. That gives me hope and that should give young women hope as well, that they have to keep reaching. We are very close right now to having a woman as a vice president. That's big, that is huge. And we have to realize our potential. And I think a lot of times people don't, as women, we don't realize our potential. And it's a lot of haters out there and they try to break you down and tell you what you cannot do. But if you believe it in yourself and you have the right attitude, you definitely could do it. Thank now, you. to say about the, the leadership is that you have to have good communication skills. You got to be willing to guide people along to a positive direct in a positive direction. Um, and just know that things that are important to you are important to other residents as well. And so I just tell um, young girls, believe in yourself. That's all you can do. Believe in yourself. When you look in the mirror, you stay focused on what you're doing and you believe in yourself. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Commissioner Higgins. Uh, yeah. So I was thinking about some of the barriers and I think for many of us, um, not seeing ourselves in the roles we'd like to be leaders in, particularly as we were growing up as, as kids. <clears throat> um, I think that's, that's a barrier. But I also think a barrier for us is being afraid to be that first person in that role. And I was just thinking back, uh, so I majored in mechanical engineering in college and I got a job in a factory, uh, which was not very glamorous. But they had never imagined that a woman would work there because this was 35 something years ago. And so there wasn't a woman's bathroom in the control room. So on day one, it was kind of like, well, what do we do now? Um, but it ends up, you know, you just go in there and you do it. And, and one of the guys I worked with was nice enough. He went home, you know, those children's games where you spin around. He took that out, took the spinner, and he made a little sign where if you were this way, the bathroom was the ladies' room, and then you flipped it the other way, it became the men's room. And, and so being fearless about entering situations where we haven't been before, I think, is, is a, it's a barrier. But when you do it, it feels really good when you get there. And sometimes there are, are guys that may want to hold you back, but sometimes there are ones that are willing and, and supportive on that. Um, I also want to talk about what makes a good leader because leadership implies the long term, right? Not the short term. And I think we all know how easy it is to let the urgent overshadow the important, but it's the important things that are worked on that makes a, a really good leader. And so particularly for you, you young women out there, when you get put in a position of leadership, please take time to set those long-term goals, because that's what you're going to be remembered for, not just for what you did today, but for what you will have accomplished over time. So you've got to set those goals and you've got um, to, to stick to them. And I'll just give you an example from my work now. I took as my number one priority affordable housing, right? We, gotta, we have a lot of things we could work on, but for me, I said affordable housing is what on my first two years I'm going to work the most on. And so the voters are going to get an opportunity in August to choose me or choose someone else. But I have plans in place to build and renovate 3,600 units in the next four years in District 5. Those plans and that vision and that long-term goal, they're established. The financing is there. They're going to be built, whether Thank I'm you. there or not. So long-term goal. Thank you so much. Excuse me. And I'm going to pass the baton on to Ms. Lee Kinsler. Thank you so much, Commissioner Higgins. Excuse me. These minutes are flying. Uh, Ms. Ms. Jones, young lady, you're going to learn that leadership is not being saying I'm a leader. Leadership is about doing what you say you're going to do. If you are a leader, it automatically shows you lead by example. You do things without questioning, without asking. You don't go and gravitate to I'm this, I'm that. 
you go ahead and make it do what it do. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. As a poet, as an author, as an activist, as a playwright, as a business owner, as a teacher, these are not things I chose to do. These are things that I had to do in order to identify. You lead without prejudiceness. You don't say, well, if you're not connected or related or selected, I can't help that person. A leader helps people regardless of their background, their class, or their color. Do you understand that, Ms. Jones? You don't, oh, well, if they're not affiliated with my organization or whoever or what I'm doing, you don't disrespect. You lead without judgmental values. That's a leader. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, former Mayor Lerner. The, thank you. The question for uh, women is what is the barrier that we see? And I would say for the most part, it is uh, a lack of confidence, the self-confidence. Uh, and yes, it takes courage. Um, to step up and put yourself forward uh, to run. It takes a thick skin to run uh, and to be in office, but uh, women uh, do not have the level of confidence that they should, that uh, we need to work on. We need to encourage our daughters, our sisters, our um, colleagues and friends uh, and make them uh, feel the confidence that, that they should have. Men, whether they've got the qualities or not, they have this over um, abundance of confidence and they'll jump into anything and say, I'll run, I'll lead, I'll share. Um, we need to start doing that same thing. And then in terms of what are the qualities that uh, women bring to leadership, I would say the uh, best one that we possess is the, in the nature of being uh, collaborative in how we approach problem solving and how we uh, engage our communities. Uh, it's a much more collaborative aspect to the way we deal with issues, with problems and solutions that help us be much more successful uh, when we are in positions of leadership. Thank you so much, Ms. Lerner. Commissioner Levine Kava. I love this question and I love these answers. So I think uh, as several have said, it's like an opportunity for us to learn from each other, which I think women are good at, listening and learning uh, and, uh, and, and drawing strength from each other. Uh, I have to say that as a child, I was told I could do anything. And I know that's not true for so many young women. So I was very fortunate in that regard. But I created my own barrier, which was I felt I needed to know everything before I could do something, before I could put myself out there as the leader. Um, you know, I, I, I was a risk taker, but I wanted to be certain that I would lead uh, with, every, with all the tools that I needed to do a good job. So uh, I started slowly building, let's say my leadership portfolio in, in high school, I was active in the, in the newspaper, um, drama, and then in college I led the Big Brother Big Sister program. I actually became student council president. I have to say that was a breakthrough for me. Um, to, I was the first uh, woman student council president at my university, Yale University. And that was like, oh, I could do it. So I think you know, from my experience, which I think translates to others, it's like building blocks that you draw strength as you move forward and you see you can do it, that you don't have to have all the answers, that you can learn on the job. But it wasn't really until I got into um, office, I think, six years ago, that I fully realized the importance of women mentoring women. And we became the first county to adopt the UN Treaty Convention to End Discrimination Against Women. And that has led to pay equity uh, obligations of those that contract with the county. It's led to making it easier for women in county government to get the recognition they deserve uh, for their additional training and experience and be rewarded with pay increases. And I have been fighting, along with the Women's Fund, actually, for pay equity, 
which I want to just move to this. It's not just about our own sense of confidence and competence. There are systemic barriers like that women start out paid lower, don't advance at the same rate, and therefore we have a huge pay equity gap in society, which is shameful. Still, you know, 80 cents on the dollar and even less for women of color compared to white men for the same job. So these are systemic issues. They're not just attitude issues. And we need to change them through policy. And that's why we need women, uh, strong leaders to make it so. Uh, but mentorship, women each to each other. And my personal uh, goal is uh, talent scouting for world benefit. And I know these other women uh, with me on this panel also have their doors open to mentor young women whenever they can. Thank you. Thank you, Elkiria Jones, Urgent Inc. Thank you. I know you're staying with us, but we're gonna invite our next young leader to introduce herself. You still have Welcome. two uh, Next. Hi. Slide, Hi, my name is Valeria. I'm a seventh grader and currently a Be Strong International Ambassador, where I help out uh, in the Girl Empowerment Program. That is fantastic. So we're going to actually start the next one with uh, Ms. Regalado wasn't able to um, be with us because she's doing her radio show. She, she, she has a short sort of one combined introduction and question, and we're going to roll that now. So, so Mara, uh, Ms. Metellus and I didn't get a chance or opportunity to answer that question. Will we Did, have some Oh time? my goodness, it's because my slide isn't moving. <laughs> <Okay>. I am <laughs> so grateful <laughs> because there are strong women here. And look at me, that's why I'm, I'm messing up. I'm not looking at a, if we can move the, the slide, Vivi. I'm, I'm using a cheat sheet. No, okay. it's okay. T yeah, go ahead. So. Um, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I wanted to, to do a quick show in Inc. and the leadership there, Celia Nelson, Shadia Nelson. Um, I've worked with them personally and I know the impact uh, their, their programming makes in the, in the lives of young girls. So Ms. Jones, thanks for the question. Uh, I think a barrier that is um, really apparent and, and has been for me has been about um, balancing. So I have so many roles as a, a wife and a mother, a grandmother, uh, a associate professor at Barry University, a community advocate, a business owner, that um, I, I, I often am always trying to see how I can balance all of these roles out. And uh, that takes a lot of perspective. And then it also takes a lot of understanding and making sure that we are really very clear about what our expectations are in our roles. So that's what I think in, in terms of a barrier, um, in terms of what a strong leader needs to be. Uh, definitely women, I think, take on a different uh, type of leadership role in which they are more compassionate, they have more empathy, um, they you know, really uh, stand by and believe in social justice, they're flexible, and they're coalition builders. So those are, those are the things in terms of, um, as, as a quick answer, the things that I think that a, um, a leader should really be bringing. And that's what I hope to bring to the job of uh, Miami-Dade County Commissioner for District 3. You muted, Myra. Thank Am you. My turn now? Thank you so much for keeping me on track, doctor. And please take it away, Ms. Metellus. Thank you so much. And so what a, what a great question, Ms. Jones. So I would say, in addition to the answers provided by uh, the women on this panel, I would add that we have all internalized the societal barriers that have been erected uh, before us as women. And so those barriers have, to a large extent, maintain many of us or kept many of us from uh, fulfilling our destinies, uh, reaching our potential, playing the roles that we dream of playing or doing the things that we dream of doing. Uh, and so in addition to the societal roles, you know, there are also real institutional barriers, right? Uh, I, it just struck me that even as we celebrate the centennial of the right of women to vote, uh, this right was not extended to black women, right? And so institutional barriers, I think that black women, women of color, uh, face additional barriers, right? 
uh, and we we can we can actually get into that um, for the rest of the day, really. But I think it's important that as women leaders, we understand those distinctions, those differences. We understand the nuances of leadership, and and how leadership is um, it, how women of color are impacted by, by those various barriers. And I think in terms of preparing for these roles, you know, it is a combination of skills that, 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 that are necessary, are required uh, at any given time, right? So confidence, I heard many of us say, that, say this already, confidence is crucial. You need to be confident, you need to be prepared, you need to have, what is this, 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 this word, cur. Uh, that that where the word courage derives from, you really need to have courage to 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 take on what you want to do, the courage to lead, the courage to act, the courage to speak out, the courage to do what you want to do in spite of. And so, I think many of us, if not all of us, continue to work on improving ourselves and increasing our confidence and 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 making sure that the world. Uh, sees us, recognizes us, all of us, as the as the unspoken power that we actually are. Thank you so much. And now, as previously announced, the one recorded intervention of Ms. Regalado. Campaigning, uh, since as long as I can remember, my first job was with Bob Graham. I loved politics since the day I met Janet Reno, and I knew that what I wanted to be was a politician. So I've always loved policy uh, and went to law school with a desire to do policy later on. And what was interesting for me is when my father ran for a mayor, I did his campaign, and at the same time, my mother passed away and I got divorced. I was 33 at the time and I had two small children. Isabella, six, had just been diagnosed with autism. And I was talking to my dad about how frustrated I was about the school system. And sitting at Maria's Greek restaurant, he said, why don't you run? Uh, so I ran. Uh, and at the time, people were like, well, what are you doing running? You have these two small children. I had a six-year-old and a four-year-old at the time. Everyone told me you should wait raise your children and after your children go off to college then you can do this politics thing because you can't be a mom and be a politician uh which i disagreed with even at the school board which by the way we have to say is one of the few places where people tolerate female leaders right it's one of the first places where women can go and take that first step in this county race you know i think it's great that women are that are retired run and i think they should have a seat at the table but i think you also need younger women i'm 45 turning 46 uh that have a different perspective because the reason that i'm running for the county seat is because um, adults with disabilities don't have jobs i'm worried about our economy i'm worried about my children's ability to live in miami Dade county i'm a native miamian my kids are priced out of this market we have an income gap issue so women make less and we'll move because we're like, well, if I go to Jacksonville and I make 60,000, I can buy a house. If I live in Miami and I make 60,000, I'm gonna live in an efficiency. So it's a very different world. And a lot of women don't wanna live at home. They wanna have their own place uh, and make their own decisions. Uh, and I think it's important to have that voice at the table also. The thing that I want the girls that are watching this to know is there is never a perfect time to run. Women are always waiting for a perfect time to run. Men wake up, they put on their pants, they totally are prepared, and they run for office. And the same thing with jobs. That's why we don't get ahead in terms of our profession either, because we won't ask for that raise. We won't demand our place at the table, because we always think we need a little bit more time to be qualified. And last thing, we have a tendency to ask other women, and I love other women, but other women are the first ones to talk us out of running. And I have to say this because every time I've tried to talk wonderful women into running, they tell me that they're afraid of losing their privacy. They don't want to be criticized. They don't want negative campaigns. They don't want their kids to see that on Google. As someone who's been attacked a million and one times, I will tell you, your kids are going to be so proud of you. They're going to tell everyone that their mom is a badass. Uh, and that her mom gets things done, so don't let that stop you. Run, run, run. And now, thank you, Alkaria. And now, on to our next guest coming to us from the amazing program at Be Strong International, Valeria Moron Santos. Please introduce yourself and ask your first question. 
Hi, my name is Valeria. I am a seventh grader and I'm currently a Be Strong International Ambassador where I help out um, in the Girl Empowerment Program. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, where you were you ever bullied or not treated with respect and what did you do about it to make it stop? What advice would you give the girls or teens going through that? So in under two minutes, we're gonna answer Valeria's question and we're gonna start with you again, Ms. Damon. I am the first, so I will always ask questions just to make sure I'm understanding the question, but I think Valeria's question, your question is very clear and straight to the point. Um, I am a Latina, Haitian, Black immigrant, and I'm a woman. So when I came to this country at the age of seven, and um, 1986, I was living in the heart of Miami. I attended Holmes Elementary, which no longer exists over in Overtown area. My students attended um, Northwestern Senior High School. And as a seven year old um, who did not speak the language, yeah, I was attacked. Um, I was embarrassed because I didn't speak the language, right? And I was a newcomer. I was actually attacked by my own race because Haitians had such a bad stigma that, you know, one of it was Haitians had bad odor. I didn't have bad odor, but that was what everyone was saying. Um, Haitians were ignorant. I had to deal with that as a seven-year-old who was like the top of my class coming from Haiti and then being placed about two grades back because our system in America just says that. So I was placed two grades back, even though I was well advanced in my country. My parents didn't know any better, so they accepted that. So I lived a life literally from elementary school, and I can honestly tell you all the way to high school being bullied. How did I have to deal with it? I used to go home and tell my parents, what do I say when they say this to me? And my parents didn't speak English properly, right? And they would say, well, just say then. And I would go to school and say, well, then. And they would say, you're so stupid. And I was like, then. But as I got older, right, I'm like, what did that really mean? It meant nothing. But that's what my parents thought was like the best thing. I didn't have an opportunity, nor did the school offer any options to say, hey, if anyone's bullying you and fighting with you, I was getting, literally, I was in fights after school every day with young girls my age who thought because I was an immigrant that I could, I'm the best person that they could bully. So yeah, I dealt with bullying. That's a powerful uh, story. That's a powerful story for our young ladies. Amazing to feel themselves represented here. It's incredible. It's incredible. And we're going to move on so we get to make sure we have a third young lady and a third question I don't want to miss. So we're going to continue on with Ms. Fulton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to just say, uh, I guess through high school, I was with very strong uh, students like myself. And I wasn't bullied in, in high school. I wasn't bullied going through school. But I do remember an incident that happened when I was in college. And um, we played a rival school. And the bus took us to that particular school. We got off the bus. And they were throwing things at us, you know. And we were just there to go to a game. And so um, it wasn't really much that we can do at the time. But I just remember the feeling that I got. And it was almost like we were helpless. Like, what do we do now? Um, they did call security. They called the police department. And we were able to see the game. And, and then once we got back on the uh, bus to go back to the school, we did report it. Um, and of course, they did something about it to try to handle it. But it was other students that, you know, because we were African-Americans and it was a predominantly white school, that was the part that, you know, the bully came in. But um, I, can, I can pretty much say, like, through school, I did my best to, um, I grew up with two brothers, and they made me, you know, stand up for myself. So when I went to school, I definitely stood up for myself, and I can never say that I let somebody push me around. 
I was always standing firm and I would always help somebody who I did see um, that was bullied, you know, and, and that's the only involvement I had with bullying through, through, throughout school. But thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fulton. Commissioner Higgins. Yes. Well, I kind of like Ms. Fulton. I, I was certainly not bullied um, as a child, but treated without respect and underestimated, I think is something that, that goes along with, with being a woman, you know, why are you studying engineering? Why do you think you can do that? That sort of questioning um, of those things go along. And, and one of the things I will tell you, um, the closest I'm, co I'm coming to being bullied has happened only since I've been in office. And it is really interesting being an elected official and how um, the distance that social media, right? Social media doesn't seem personal sometimes. And the things people um, can say about you and to you, um, I mean, sometimes they're just defending their ideas, right? And we're all, we're all able to do that. But other times you read what people say and it feels very, um, almost physically threatening. So it is a reminder, I think, to all of us uh, that words, words matter in the world that we live in. And, and we as women have a responsibility to, to make sure that the way we communicate and we express what we need, and we need change, we know that, we need societal change for women, for people of color, for people who live in poverty, for people that can't afford their housing. But as we express the desire for a more positive future, to make sure that we're using words that are empowering uh, rather than crushing uh, to, to folks. So we have a responsibility to make sure that our words and our deeds inspire leaders to make changes and never ever feel as if we are pushing someone down. Thank you so much. Ms. Lee Kinsler. Um, Ms. Andrea, bullying only takes place from people who don't know who they are. Bullying is not something that can be changed by policies. Bullying is only gonna be able to change when a person understands who they are and confident with who they are. When you're not comfortable with who you are and you see someone else doing something that's beyond what you're able to do, most people turn to ridiculing, tearing you down, or blocking you, or not helping you. So bullying is something that goes on throughout life. It may not happen when you're in school, but anytime you're in a different setting, a different environment, and you're not blending in with everyone else, because to be an original, you're going to stand out. But when you're a carbon copy, you just do what everybody else says. And so when you decide to take a stand, you're usually going to be bullied by those who keep going with the norm and the tradition. So don't look at bullying as something bad. Just look at that's a person that don't understand you because they don't like you because they can't be you and they can't do you. So they will tie you down. So that's the, that's the definition of bullying, baby. So keep being strong. If you're getting bullying, that means you're doing something that they're not capable of doing. Thank um. I have had a, uh, a childhood, a professional career, and even my experiences in office, I can honestly say I have never experienced bullying. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed, I guess, in, in that regard. However, I do recognize how um, pervasive it has become especially in um, our elementary schools. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with a program called No Place for Hate that is offered in the schools uh, through the Anti-Defamation League. And I think it's important that we uh, seek out programs like that, open up the dialogue in our so that uh, students
students can understand how people need to um, recognize bullying, uh, call it out when we see it being done to anybody else uh, and report it as necessary. The No Place for Hate program does a really good job of that for the schools. So I would encourage you to look for programs like that. I'm sure there are probably others, not only in the school environment, but we're aware that it happens uh, through social media for um, youth that are online a significant amount of time. We need to make sure that people are looking for it, calling it out, uh, pushing back on the bullies, and uh, making sure that we all stand up for each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commis Commissioner Kava. Woo, what a great question. I have been thinking about this and listening to everybody and it really brought me back to my own childhood. So thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Virgin Inc. for the last round because you are great at mentoring and be strong as well. Uh, located, by the way, in my district. So proud of these young ladies. So I'm reminded that as a child, I was bullied about my weight. You know, I don't hear a lot of people talking about that, but that is a very real phenomenon uh, too. Uh, you know, how you look, that's a big part of the bullying equation. Uh, and, and there was bullying in the school and there was bullying in the neighborhood and there was bullying in my household uh, about this. And that was very formative for me, I have to say. Um, and then I agree with my colleague, Commissioner Higgins, that really the biggest bullying I've experienced has been since I've been in elected office. And that happens uh, on a daily basis on social media with outrageous comments that, you know, by the way, as elected officials, we can't um, really censor what goes on on social media because we are accountable to the public and the public has a right to comment. But apparently, uh, many cruel things uh, are protected speech and, and that is the reality. Um, so it always hurts. And most recently in my campaign, I've been the subject of an outrageous bullying campaign, uh, exactly tearing down my record, saying that I am the person that's cutting funding to basic programs like domestic violence for children, affordable housing, LGBTQ youth, the homeless. I mean, this is exactly what I've stood up for my entire life. So it's extremely sinister kind of bullying from an anonymous uh, secret source. So it's extremely hard to fight back. So at the end of the day, it's about the strength, as some have said, that we bring to this, that we can, uh, that we can know that it's a tribute to us and our strength that somebody feels threatened to attack us. That doesn't make it feel any better, but it can hopefully help us to step back and think about all that we bring to the table that might be threatening. Uh, but also we need to teach everybody kindness, empathy. That's how we get rid of bullying, by really uh, preventing that kind of attack that only comes when people really uh, develop greater kindness and empathy skills. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. McGee. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, this did bring me uh, like way back to thinking about my childhood as well. And uh, I was not bullied as a child. Um, I had an accent. I'm, I'm also an immigrant. Um, when I moved to uh, New York, I did have an accent, but people thought it was cute. So they didn't they didn't tease me, but they, they actually um, just made me say things over and over again. But that's not the bullying I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about my best friend at the time and that during that age period, um, you know, sh her family did not have a lot and they, um, people teased her and, and bullied her for that. And I was one of probably the only kids in the neighborhood that stood up for her that you know said that that this is not right and we can't do it any longer. Um, so this is something that I wanted to to share because I think people sometimes bullies don't understand the impact that they're making and they don't really have the idea that okay I'm I'm really hurting somebody by doing these things. So I think that in terms of of kids today, the things that they can do to look for safe spaces to be able to share. 
um, express their feelings about bullying. Um, I'm thinking all about my social work background and again, um, the trauma that we see in a lot of communities impacts kids in different ways. And sometimes their, their only outlet is to, um, to do those acts against other people. But that's, that's what we want to take away from that is that, that we want to give the kids that are being bullied the ability to express their feelings, to reach out, to, to have safe spaces which, in which they can um, share what they're feeling about the, the, the bullying. So that's what I would want to say. Um, it, it's, it's something that I, I hope nobody has to experience. It's, it's not a good feeling at all. Thank you so much, Ms. Metellus. Here again, a, a deep, profound question. And so, yes, uh, I too have been bullied uh, as, a, as an immigrant to this country. You know, I too arrived in New York. Uh, and when I, you know, when I arrived, the nickname for Haitians was Frenchie, right? And so you can imagine that it, it, it was just as disparaging as the term you Haitian happens to play out right here in Miami-Dade County. And so the story that I recall is, you know, how Haitian families, Haitian parents have this tradition of combing your hair and, you know, three sets of braids, barrettes, and all sorts of ribbons. You know, your, your, your hair looks like a Christmas tree. That's how filled it is with stuff. And I can't tell you the number of times that my braids were undone, my barrettes were taken. My, it, it, was, it was awful. And... You know, at home, when I, when I recounted the story, it seems that they always took me back to a question of heritage. Remember who you are. Remember that, you know, you are, you're Haitian. Remember that your ancestors achieved the, the greatest feat in the history of the world, you know, and overthrowing enslavement and beating Napoleon's army. So you can do that. You, you stand up to these people. You remember who you are. And so uh, all of those, of course, it took me a while to sort of process all that and, and develop my own ability to express it when, in fact, I, I was encountering bullying. And so I would say that it's that experience, that story, that memory that's always um, instilled in me this, this sense or this need uh, in working with, with students, when I was a teacher in particular, to always give these students a sense of themselves a sense of their history, a sense of their place, in order to combat the bullying that they surely faced and that many kids will continue to face either because they're immigrants, because they speak with an accent, because maybe they don't sound, uh, they, they don't sound too cool, too hip, uh, or that you know, they don't fit in uh, based on someone's criteria. And so again, for me, it's about your sense of self, your sense of place, your sense of history, and, and important tools to help you combat not just young bullies, but older bullies too. Thank you, Thank you so very much. We have a powerful third question and I inter I'd like to uh, welcome Star de Haiti to please introduce herself and ask her question. And once again, it will be just under uh, two minutes or under for the answers. Go ahead, Star, welcome. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Star Haiti. I'm a recent graduate of Young Women's Preparatory Academy. Um, a lot of the extracurriculars I participated in during high school did involve leadership and advocacy, as well as the offices that I did hold in some um, clubs and different organizations. In the fall, I'll be attending Stanford University. I'll be studying environmental engineering and physics, as well as a minor in either philosophy or African studies, I'm still deciding. Um, but my question for you all, let me pull it up. As most issues are multifaceted in your leadership as a woman and many different other identities, how will you ensure or enact policy that is intersectional, inclusive, and weary of discrimination? What a question. Ms. Demond, two minutes. Thank you. Um, and I've said this already. Um, so because of my background and because of who I am, because of the fact that I am an immigrant, Latina, Black, and everything else you can put, um, one of my main focus that I would definitely get straight in 
you know, whether I become mayor or not, and then I'm continuing to do it right now, is making sure that that I, people like myself, people like Latinas and um, Jews, you know, Asians, everyone are included in everything that is happening, especially in Miami-Dade County, because at times we think that the policies in place really covers everyone, but because of subliminal messages and because of underlying issues, we tend to not realize that the policies, just like someone mentioned earlier, Yes, women were allowed to vote, but then black women were not allowed to vote. So yes, you can become the mayor, but when I look at you as a black woman, I cannot see you as our mayor because you're black. And I honestly can't believe you can do it, even though I am a PhD candidate, that's not sufficient for some people. I have to go above and beyond. So the policies that I would make, that I would go straight into is making sure that I and everyone else, women in particular, are included in everything. Our language barrier, again, because I speak Haitian Creole, it's an issue for us in the United States. It's an issue for us right here in Miami-Dade County. It's an issue for us in the state where um, exams can be taken in Spanish and English, but it cannot be taken in Creole, where Creole, Haitian Creole, is the third largest um, language spoken in Miami-Dade County. So these are some of the things that I will attack immediately um, in order to make sure that it's that we're all included in our in the policies that are being made right now and in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Ms. Fulton. Ms. Fulton. Am I missing Ms. Oh, Fulton? No, I'm here. There we go. Hi. I want to say um, um, that there are definitely policies and procedures in place um, to have everybody included to make sure that this particular county is diverse um, by making sure that, of course, we know this is a melting pot. But I think the only part that is a problem is that uh, there's no compliance. We, we're not following through. So people make these policies and then they don't check on uh, the policies to make sure that people are in compliance. And so that's one of the things that's important to me. It's not about what necessarily about what you say, because you can say almost anything right now. Um, that sounds good to the ear, but it's how you make people feel that's important. How people are being treated is what's important. And so we just got to make sure that everybody, um, people are in compliance. We got to make sure it, the, the uh, atmosphere is diverse. We have to make sure that we include everybody. And that's something that I would do in District 1. I would make sure everybody is included, um, not just Mommy Gardens, but Opalaka as well not just the uh, uh, African-Americans, because we know District 1 is predominantly African-American, but what about the Hispanic? What's about the Haitian community? We have to bring everybody in. And there's others that's also in the district that we have to include. And so that's something that I, um, that's important to me, results. And not just, you know, just a bunch of hot air coming out of somebody's mouth. But are we in compliance? Are we actually doing these things? And are we making people feel included in their own community? Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Higgins. Well, I think uh, there is a lot more to be done to make sure that Miami-Dade County works for everybody and not just for, for some people. And it's been really interesting being on the commission because some great ideas have been proposed and been shot down that could have lifted all kinds of people that tend to be left behind, um, particularly in low wage jobs, right? We still, um, my colleague, Commissioner um, Daniela Levine Cava, tried to make sure that for county contracts and subcontracts that the workers got paid sick leave. And the folks on the commission voted against it during a pandemic, guys, during a pandemic. But what that means is that's an example of an economic policy that structurally holds people of color back, 
who tend to be in a lot of these low wage jobs that don't come with benefits and it holds women back right because living wage is another example on our contracts not all of our contracts particularly at the airport pay a living wage and many of those employees are people of color and also women so there is a ton of work that needs to be done structurally on the economic side um, of things at the county going forward and that's why i think it's very very important for you to think about who our next mayor is and who the, what the makeup of the commission will be because right now things like moving forward living wages and making that broader moving forward on paid sick days so that people can take time off if they feel ill all of those things right now we are blocked at the county commission so it's really important no matter where you live to look at those candidates and help us make a difference because i believe in that stuff but I need a, a bigger cadre of people that also believe in making sure that inclusionary, equitable policies that help everyone can actually be passed at the county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Lee Kinsler. Um, I did some research to see who running the boards, who run, running housing, who running the FEM, who running the things we need in our community. Just because you have policies doesn't mean they're acted upon. I want, as your Miami-Dade County Mayor for District 3, to enforce what is on the books. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to enforce it. And as a person that's a business owner here in Dade County, uh, I have a car wash that I have a contract with Miami, uh, with the University of Miami, Jesse Trice, but I've never received any help or assistance financially. And I'm a woman, but because I'm from Liberty City and I'm from the community that we tend to say we doing all these programs for this neighborhood. So you don't need no one who really represent Liberty City that is accommodating, that is competent. It seems like we want to focus on pushing things to make us look like a certain image that we're not so people could say, oh, whoa, it's them. We need to help the little people in Liberty City or over town. And I'm here representing to bring change to that, change the players of this game. Don't change the policies, advance the policies. We need to change the people who are not being policed with these policies. That is my thing to do with policies here in Dade County. Thank you so much. Ms. Lerner. I would say, thank you. Uh, the majority of the policies advanced by the county, um, as indicated so um, expressively by Commissioner um, Higgins, are industry uh, driven. The, the majority are not uh, considering or considered um, the needs and uh, the reality facing um, those who are uh, more economically disadvantaged and uh, even the process that the administration goes through at the county level is top down and not bottoms up. Um, a couple of examples with the pandemic and everything being shut down, the mayor uh, brought in um, major industry representatives to help him uh, design a, a program with guidelines for opening up. The commissioners were not a part of the, um, the talks to develop the guidelines. The people who are elected to represent their own districts were not a part of those discussions. The media was not a part of those discussions, they were all closed door. So um, we have got to reframe how we determine policy and make sure it is bottoms up and not top down driven the way it's always been. Um, same thing with our uh, climate change, sea level rise programs and policies. They are not uh, responsive to or uh, are respectful of the most vulnerable population in the county. There's a Miami Climate Alliance that looks at those issues 
It is very grassroots driven, but the county is not taking all of the recommendations that have been uh, compiled by this alliance of grassroots um, ad advocates to make sure that our policies are responsive to the most vulnerable. So Thank that's so got to be uppermost in the minds of a future mayor and county commission. I'm going to take advantage to say that our next impact collaborative on August 6th is going to be extremely cutting edge with brilliant experts on that very self same subject. And um, many of those topics may not have been heard all in community. We have people from um, many of the community organizations as well as scientists and community leaders. So August 6th, we invite you to join us a very important upcoming impact collaborative. Uh, Dr. McGee, all yours. Okay, thank you so much for the question. I, I, I'm hoping that I get it right, but the, uh, I wanted to just mention the fact that District 3 is comprised of very diverse and distinct communities. And I want to be able to listen to all of the constituents of District 3 and represent everyone. So I, I'm, I'm saying that specifically because I think that there are some, um, uh, some candidates and some people who think that, okay, there's only one part of District 3 that needs representation, but I, I wanna make sure that everyone knows we're going to be able to represent all of District 3. Um, and some of the things, the other parts of the question about inclusivity, um, that's, that's the reason why I wanna mention that and make sure that people know that you, you need a county commissioner who's going to be accessible and accountable uh, to the residents. The question or that part of the question about intersectionality, I agree. We cannot take any, any one problem or, or challenge that Miami-Dade County faces in, um, in seclusion of any other part. Because if you're talking about <coughs> the economy and making sure that we are um, invested in, in making sure we have better paying jobs so that we can afford to uh, live in, uh, in Miami-Dade County and, the, and again, get housing that is um, not just affordable, but also workforce housing, mixed use housing. Um, and then you have transportation that's connected to that. So all of these issues need to be looked at in a holistic manner. Uh, again, with my background and experience, I think that's what I can bring. Um, and then I know that there are disparities. Again, as I mentioned, the diverse needs of, of District 3, you know that there are disparities uh, across the county and we need to address them. There is a disparity study and we need to take that out look at all of the recommendations and make sure that we are, um, as county commissioners, really moving the needle forward in that direction. Thank you so much, Ms. Metellus. Maria, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, uh, we skipped Commissioner Cava. <laughs> you ready for me? Cava. I yield. <laughs> how, how should the we go? Do you want so to talk about working moms, my dog keeps on opening the door. And every time that happens, I've messed up today. My apologies. And, and I'm sure you're all joining with me in the working mom. <laughs> My apologies, uh, Commissioner Kava. Okay, no worries. Uh, never argue with the moderator. That's an important- <laughs> Not my um, day, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, once again, I'm listening and learning to all of the members of this panel. And I wanna say, Stara, you've got a great future. We need you back in Miami-Dade County after you get that great education at Stanford. And um, you know whether you choose African history, African American history, or environmental um, engineering, uh, we need you with those skill sets. So thanks for the great question. So again, I want to say we have systemic and structural uh, barriers to equality in our county. Uh, I do agree that monitoring is a critical component because you could just pass a law and then it sits on the shelf like a study, just like the disparity study that has just sat on the shelf. Uh, you know, we have equality goals, they sit on the shelf if we do not put muscle behind it and, and monitoring because people will only do what they're measured to do. And uh, so let me say that as far as women uh, go, we have this great baseline that was created because we became the first county to adopt this UN treaty to end discrimination in all forms against women, uh, CEDAW. 
And uh, that was my initiative. It was the first thing I worked on actually before I even came into office after my election. And it's been the gift that keeps on giving. We've been able to do incredible things. So for example, we've rewritten the sex harassment policy, which was 25 years old in Miami-Dade County. Uh, we have um, created a mandate that all contractors have to uh, say that they will pay equitably on the basis of gender. Uh, and But again, are we monitoring that? Are we training? We need to put our money where our mouths are on this. Uh, and you know what? We also need to do the very same for issues of race and ethnicity. We do not have a pay equity policy yet that applies to those. So even though uh, we might have goals, uh, we, we're not really living up to our highest aspirations. We have a small business enterprise program, but during the time since recession, the percentage of women own businesses winning contracts has gone down. So there are ways that we can fix this that as the strong mayor, I will address. So I will have an office of equity and inclusion that will monitor all of our policies, our budget, in terms of how we lift up those communities that have been left behind. That includes women, that includes communities of color. Uh, you know, we need to do more then, uh, you know, what is it? Put lipstick on a pig. We have to make sure that we are really uh, honoring uh, everybody in our community and lifting them up. The pay equity gap that we have for women is, is outrageous. You know, it's still, you know, 83 cents on the dollar uh, and much lower for women of color. Um, not acceptable. Uh, we also have to have training. You know, there's anti, uh, there's implicit bias trainers for our police. There needs to be implicit bias training for everyone. And that needs to not just be about race, it needs to be about gender. So um, enforcement, monitoring, uh, training, and uh, monitoring. So those are the things that I will do to make sure that women and all people uh, are treated fairly and that we make up for past wrongs. You're thank me. you very much. And thank you, Ms. Metellus, for your patience with me as well today. Last but not least for this question, please go ahead. Thank you so much. So, you know, as a nonprofit leader, I have developed over the many years, the, the skills, the expertise and the experience and policy formulation and targeted solutions to address specific needs, right? As a woman, I want to say that I would be dishonoring my values, dishonoring the legacy of female leadership by not paying attention to the nuances, the specificities, the, the, the special challenges that impact different segments of our community. And I wanna offer you, promise you that as, as your next county commissioner, I am going to be very attentive to these nuances, to the specificities, to the equity to the, to the intersectionality issues that, 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 that come into play and formulating policy, you know, going from race to ethnicity, to gender, to education, to wealth, all of these issues that impact uh, uh, the ways in which we formulate policy and protect from the unintended consequences that they might have when we're not paying attention. So that, I promise you, that I will stand by. Thank you. And thank you to all the extraordinary leaders who have stepped up your willingness to serve the public is extraordinary. And we could not be any more grateful. It's very, very heartening to see you all. Extraordinary, extraordinary young ladies. Thank you so much for your leadership with your questions. Please, quickly, last day to register to vote in Miami-Dade County for our August primary elections, our very important primary elections, is now in 18 days, July 20th. Please register for the primary elections to request your vote by mail ballot. You must do it by August 8th, so do it today. You can go to vote411.org find more nonpartisan information on the 2020 election cycle. And 18th is that primary election of August. Please vote. All politics are local. Very important elections. And the general election, will remind you, is November 3rd. And 
a friendly but adamant reminder to please fill out your census 2020 online. There is the link. Numbers matter, resources matter. Please represent all of us to our best and highest good by registering for the census. And with that, we remind you an amazing lineup for next month's uh, back to a little bit more of a normal uh, impact collaborative format. It will be women's health, heat, hurricanes, risk and resilience. Our experts are telling you, to telling us that those issues combined with quarantine and COVID are going to be majorly, majorly important for us to address before it happens, especially for our most vulnerable populations. You'll have brilliant, brilliant experts here from the community and scientists. So please register, please fill in our survey. It makes a difference to us. It's like gold, leave your comments, please. It makes a difference. That exit survey will come into your inboxes. And for now, we ask you to stay safe, stay strong, and thank you. And thank you, League of Women Voters and Miami-Dade Commission for Women. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day.